Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Dan in Gainesville, Florida, and today we have acclaimed writing designer Mark Stanley with us. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. Oh, you went back to up again. Yeah, I don't like low. I can't go low. All right, fair enough, but I'm into the subs these days. You are into the subs. I cannot compete. So I have to do my sort of fake falsetto sort of thing going on. But anyway, hey everyone, welcome to episode 168. And today we have an amazing show and a special guest, a very old friend. Not to say that he's old. We're not because, old. Because we're not old. He's not old. He's matured. It's Mark Stanley. Mark, it's great to have you here. Oh, yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's great to be with you guys. Boy, after all these years, we've been trying to get him on the show, and uh, he's he, here. But he was willing from the get-go. It just took time to organize. Oh, oh, he was totally willing, but he's a very busy guy. I was a very busy guy. You're not a busy, <laughs> that's true. But you and the rest of the industry. <laughs> that's right. And now you're living the good life in a hammock with a Mai Tai. A to, hammock you know. with a Mai Tai. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. <laughs> so before we go down that rabbit hole, why don't you tell us, Stan, how busy Mark has been over the past... What, 30 years? 40 years? 200 years? years? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to try. So here we go, folks. Mark Stanley, resident lighting designer for New York City Ballet, has designed over 200 premieres for their repertoire, including Paul McCartney's Ocean Kingdom. He has worked with choreographers around the world, including Peter Martins, Alexei Retmansky, Susan Stroman, Christopher Wielden, Justin Peck, William Forsyth. Kevin O'Day, Susan Marshall, and many others. His designs are in the repertoire of nearly every major ballet company in North America and Europe, including the Royal Ballet, the Paris Opera Ballet, the Royal Danish Ballet, Het National Ballet, the Bolshoi Ballet, the San Francisco Ballet, La Scala Ballet, Marinsky Ballet, Norwegian National Opera and Ballet, Boston Ballet, Stuttgart Ballet, Miami City Ballet, Palabalist Dance Theater, Alvin Ailey Dance Theater, and the Joffrey Ballet. Mr. Stanley previously served as resident designer for the New York City Opera. His theater work includes the Kennedy Center, Long Wharf Theater, Goodspeed Opera House, Ordway Music Theater, Paper Mill Playhouse, Maurice Sendak's Night Kitchen, and Off-Broadway. His designs for George Balanchine's The Nutcracker and others have been seen on Live from Lincoln Center and great performances. Mr. Stanley also heads the lighting design program at Boston University and is on the board of directors of the Hemsley Lighting Programs. I have to breathe now, but wow, isn't that a life? Isn't that a career? I have a question, Mark. When do you think your career is going to take off? (laughs) <laughs> what is this story? I mean, you've been doing this a long well, time. Well, the one uh, the one credit you didn't mention was uh, Equity Library Theater, which back in the day was you know once you'd done Equity Library Theater, you knew right. you'd made it, right? So you are I so mean, right about that. I remember that. Now. I think I even worked there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I remember that. Everybody's saying, "Well, you got to work the Equity Library." That's the first big break that you yeah. have. Wow. Well, yeah, well, Gilbert did a lit a cave outside of Madison, Wisconsin once, and he said, <laughs> he said his career had nowhere to go but up after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got to start, start in a cave. I love you know, it. W- one thing that's not in your bio is that you are one of the original Gilbert Bunnies. I am. Um, I am actually the last Gilbert Bunny. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dwayne Schuler and uh, Steve Ross and uh Actually, Danny Abelson could probably claim the credit to be the very first uh, Gilbert Bunny. But Dwayne Schuler and I sort of bookend Gilbert's uh, bunny career. Wow. Nice. That, how many years was that? Um, you know, it was probably about 12 years, 12 or 13 years. He started in Madison in the early 70s and then uh, passed away in the fall of 1983. Those were amazingly golden years. Now, oh, they really I, I was are. fortunate to be a part of the last few years, and I learned so much from Gilbert. I, I, people who listen to the show know how fond I am of him, and so much of this business is being at the right place at the right time. And boy, you guys were, I mean, you went to the right school at the right time. Yeah, so. it, it was an amazing time for sure. So let's get the ball rolling. And Steve has our first question. 
So, Mark, let's backtrack here and talk about all that work and dance. How did you uh, get started and why do you keep doing it? Um, I was actually a uh, pre-vet student uh, my freshman year of undergrad. Um, I had done a lot of theater, but this company came to uh, William & Mary, where I was an undergrad student, called the Alwyn Nikolai Dance Theater. And he was a pioneer in the use of projection and color and multimedia uh, and really creating dance that was beyond movement. It was all about physicality of objects and shapes. Uh, and they did a residency there for a week at William & Mary, and I was on the lighting console as part of my work study. And uh, after that, I changed my major. <laughs> I said, I said, I got to do that. I just have to do that. It was so amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, looking back on it, it was just, it was transformative. Um, so, you know, how you used to have to write on your resume at the top, you'd have to write your career objective. That was the, that was the thing we, you'd do, right? And uh, by my senior year of undergrad, my career objective was to be the resident lighting designer of a dance company. Wow. So here we are. Do you remember breaking that news to your parents? Yeah, they, still, they, they kept the letter, actually. <laughs> to, no, yeah, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be a veterinarian anymore. Were you going to be specializing in horses? Or yeah, large pigs? animal vet. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. I grew up uh, going to my grandparents' farm every summer, and uh, so that was the... That was the beginning of that. That explains all those coveralls you used to wear in yes. the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't you cook eggs for Gilbert? Oh, we cooked everything for Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my very first Thanksgiving in Madison, he looked at me and he said, how do you do with batters? And I said, batters? <laughs> and he said, yes, I, ha I was recently at the Kennedy Center and I tasted this camembert cheese in a batter with raspberry sauce, and I want to serve it for Thanksgiving. Can you make that? <laughs> <laughs> I spent the next 72 hours perfecting batters. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, and we had a great um, dance program at William & Mary, and I got to dan design at least two shows a year there. Uh while I was an undergrad in dance. And I just fell in love with it. Um, and, you know, I, you don't know where your career is going to go when you start out. And you, you push on doors here and there. And I sort of kept my, my hand in dance when I uh, went to Madison and then professionally when I got to New York. But there were other ways to go at the time. And I was working with Gilbert and uh, doing a lot of opera and never never thought that I would land a job as wonderful as the one at New York City Ballet. And uh, when the opportunity came up, the door opened. And Absolutely. You know, at the time, they said, uh, can you promise us you'll stay for three years? <laughs> and that, and that, was that was 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> How long has that run been? Has it been 35 years? Yeah, ago? it's been 35 years. I have a quick question. Oh, you're talking about dance and opera. What sort of musical background did you have as a child? Did uh, you have any? Yes, I had a lot of music. Um, both my parents were very musical, and mm -hmm. um, I studied piano, guitar, trombone. Uh, I was in a jazz trombone group for six years, wow. and uh, we, uh, you know, we were in the church choir, and uh, yeah, so I had a lot of music. Uh, do you still play any instruments? I still play piano and guitar. Ah, guitar. Um, Guys, are you ah, thinking what I'm I thinking? Hear, I, I know what you're thinking. What am I thinking? I was, <laughs> I was hoping for a trombone solo. Trombone. In yeah. trombone solo. That I don't think my lips would be up for uh, at this oh, point. Right. Oh, well, we, I thought we had a trombone player. Was that a sax player? No, we have a tuba player, uh, the, Don Holder. Yeah, but, but, oh, but we also yeah. had... Um, oh, that's oh, right. Rachel. That's right. Yeah, Rachel, the Hemsley winner. She plays an instrument. There were two winners this year, weren't there, Mark? Yes, we, we were able to offer the opportunity to, uh, to two candidates, which was great, um, Avery and Rachel. Right. Well, anyway, you do know about the luminoids, right? Oh, I do. 
Yes, well, uh, we have some very famous lighting designers playing in the Luminoids. Wow. Right? It's the, also available on cassette for your car. <laughs> yes, no, 8-track. We have only an 8-track. We don't have cassette. We have an 8-track of the, of the song. But Zach Bovray plays guitar and bass on that track. And maybe we'll send you some tracks. You could lay one down for us. We would love I'll, that. I'll give it a like, try. Can you imagine? Mark Stanley, that's fantastic. You could do a guitar solo or something like that. That would be oh, so I, I was cool. strictly the rhythm guy. <laughs> okay, well, put, put a rhythm part <laughs> in there. Take some rhythm. Take put some put rhythm. a rhythm part. You have to, we'll need a Stratocaster, okay? Yeah. Oh, I think I could get my hands on one. My next door neighbor is John Schofield, so I think... Oh, uh, <laughs> you're kidding me. No, That's no, I, I could ask him for one of his uh, his guitars. Better yet, oh, wow. ask him to lay down a That's track. Right. There you go. <laughs> really, I'll get him to do it and then claim it was me. <laughs> there you go. That's brilliant. <laughs> Well, I, you know, again, it's it's kind of a follow up, and I, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is. Are you still surprised by your work in dance? Does is everything you just look at it and go, "Wow, this is a new direction. This is a new idea. This is something I haven't done before." Are you still as excited about dance today as you were 35 years ago? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's what makes for me dance incredibly special. Is uh, you know, when the curtain goes up on an opening night in dance, no one has ever seen that production before. You know, the steps are new, the music may be commissioned, um, the design is brand new and only for that moment in time. And, you know, that, that doesn't say that a Shakespeare production or an opera production of La Boheme can't be new and fresh, but there's something incredibly exciting about working with a choreographer and with dancers and creating something totally from scratch. And, um, you know, that sustains you for many, many years. It's like you write the play together, you know, don't you? It comes out of your own minds. Yeah, you write the play and you create the environment and you support the mood and you do all the things that lighting designers do for all shows. But there's something ex extra special about it when it's that kind of partnership. Mm. And it's also much more expressionistic. You, know, you have a lot more freedom as a lighting designer, don't you think? Well, I don't know if I would call it freedom, but because you're not working in a realistic context, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when you are dealing with abstract images, you know, you do have that. And also nine times out of 10, it's just you and the choreographer in the room. You know, yeah. there's a costume designer, you know, and, but it's an open space. And so mm -hmm. that space is defined by light and... Right. None of those annoying set designers. That's right. Yeah. No columns in the way. No ceilings hanging no over. No ceiling, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you're so young. <laughs> I, I, you've stayed so young. You, you just you and a choreographer. How fabulous. So my question is a little bit about the obvious, Mark. So color has evolved in terms of how we make it lately. Tell us about your journey with color and in particular the light workbook that you put together. Yeah, well... Um, I really didn't know much about color as an undergrad. I mean, we studied the basics. Uh, you know, you could pick up any lighting textbook and, and see the chapter on color, and that's about as far as it went with what we were studying. Right. <laughs> but um, right. when I got to Madison, uh, there, Gilbert insisted that we take a class uh, in the fine arts, in the visual arts department uh, on color. Uh, it was taught by a woman named Marjorie Kralik. Uh, she was a brilliant, brilliant teacher, um, and specifically about color. Uh, and I'd, I'd really never uh, delved into it like that, and it just kind of blew my mind. I mean, she, she opened up this world of expression that I had never had before. Um, and I ended up taking an independent study with her every semester that I was in Madison just because it was such a fertile uh, pursuit for me. Um, and so then when I got to, uh, I guess the other part of the equation there is that, uh, Stan Miller from Roscoe was a good friend of Gilbert's. And, uh, he came to Madison at least once, if not twice while I was there. Um, cause you know, prior to grad school, my sense of color was Roscaline 802 and Cinemoy, <laughs> Cinemoy 561. And that's about all I knew about color. So, um, 
Because of the connection to Roscoe, um, I was, I knew that was an early sort of, uh, sort of foothold in New York, I guess. So I kind of knew all the Roscoe people. And uh, they, a guy named Rob Holly decided to put together this video um, that was primarily, you know, for promotional purposes. But, um, and Stan Schwartz, who was, uh, with Roscoe at the time, he said, uh, and sadly just recently passed away too. Um, he, uh, he said, well, why don't we need a workbook that goes with this? Um, a workbook would be a good idea. So, um, you know, I was already working on the video, doing the lighting for that. And, um, and that's how that started. But, you know, my journey with color has just been a fascinating one. And, um, one of the things that I'm really, really passionate about now is that uh, I want to create and help create a vocabulary of color that works in all media. So, you know, one of the problems is that we get trapped uh, by words that apply only to pigment and dye or apply only to light. And so I created a class in, um, in Boston called Color Interaction. And it was based on the fact that one day I was walking through uh, backstage and the scene painter was talking to one of the lighting students. And uh, the scene painter was saying, I need you to make the backdrop more intense. And the lighting designer said, I can't make it more intense. Everything's at full. And oh, I, <laughs> I thought uh, uh, we have a problem, Houston. We have a problem here, and uh, and so I said, okay, this needs to be a class, and so mm. I created this class. It's a riff on you know, Albert's book, Interaction of Color, uh, and I call of color. and That's I call fantastic. it Color Interaction, and it's made up of scene designers. Uh, costume designers, scene painters, and lighting designers. And nice. we work through the projects together to try and develop this whole vocabulary of color. And so, um, yeah, that's my goal is to, to try and get people to be able to talk about color as color uh, and use the right words when they're talking about it. Um, and Wendy uh, at ETC and and uh, Clifton and I, we we go into lots of wonderful conversations about what these words really mean and 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 uh, and how we apply them. But um, I'm excited about. I I love LED lighting color. I just don't like moving it from venue to venue. That's right. <laughs> that's yeah. the problem. You know, uh, you, is it venue to venue or is it fixture to fixture? Well, both really. I yeah. mean, I I did a, a piece for ABT this spring, and we had a double LED ground row of two different manufacturers. So I was not only mixing within each ground row, but I was additively mixing between the ground rows. And uh, the show was supposed to uh, open in March at San Francisco Ballet. And they have a totally different manufacturer for their ground row. And it was just a nightmare. You know, the idea that, that all of these, you know, 85, 90 light cues, each one of them with a different color mix, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's a big issue, you know. Like in tungsten lamps, mm. they were able to make fairly good manufacturing consistency. In LED manufacturing, it's like an art. Every Everybody makes it, bake, they bake the cake a little bit differently. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, starting from scratch, it's great. It's the right. transference that's yeah. the, the right. issue. I have a follow-up uh, kind of creative process question for you, Mark. Are you finding that having the flexibility to alter color in the room, in the moment, with the choreographer, and you don't have to change a gel and get a crew out there, does that sort of change the way you work and provide a sort of a, a more free-flowing aesthetic? Or is, is, that, is, it, what, is it too many choices, or is it actually an advantage to have that freedom in, in the room, in that spontaneity? Um, I find it a total advantage. I mean, for me, it's about the nuances that I can create at that moment. And I can, I can tweak that color for every light cue in a way that we could never do it before. And it's exciting. And you can make a whole journey with the color uh, that's very, very detailed. 
So I love it. I'm glad to hear that because I think it's pretty cool. Too. Yeah, but I, I got to tell you, the lighting staff at New York City Ballet doesn't <laughs> like it at all. When, when I'm like, you know, they have a biscuit by the table backstage, and they hear me starting to create a new color, and they they're like, like, "Oh no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> we got to archive <laughs> another color." <laughs> what do we That's call that? Fifty-one point seven four zero two. You know. Right. Well, then Roscoe will give it a name. It'll, right. have, it'll be standard. Blue, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you have a do you have a color more? You should. I, I mean, I created the Hemsley blue, uh, okay. which is okay. Roscoe 361, which and is beautiful. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, that was just a wonderful uh gift that Stan Miller uh, came up with, to, and all the proceeds from it go to support the Hemsley lighting program. So, yeah, wonderful. Um, it's Speaking great. of the Hemsley lighting programs, the Hemsley internship has been such an important aspect for our industry. Tell us about your connection and about your stewardship of the program. Well, um, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, I was the last Gilbert Bunny. <laughs> and um, when he died, uh, there was just a tremendous outpouring from yeah. all of the people who had been influenced by his life, um, you know, many of whom are still working in the business today. Uh, and we wanted to create some kind of memorial, some kind of um, recognition of the importance of his life on our lives. And um, so we, I was with New York City Opera at the time, and uh, it became clear that that would be a really good place to house an internship. And so it started really from contributions uh, of all former students for the most part. Um, and we, I think the first internship was in 1984. Uh, Helen McCullough, right? Helen McCullough, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and she's helping us today with the portfolio review. and helping Give her us. my love, please. Yeah, okay. I will. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it slowly evolved. And then when I moved to New York City Ballet, that was, well, let's add that experience into the mix. And then in the early 90s, we became our own um, 501c3 nonprofit. And, uh, you know, it just became, kept growing and growing. Um, and then we added in the early 2000s the, the portfolio review. Um, so, you know, it's been a great, we, we never thought it would last. Uh, we thought it would be a three to five year thing and that would be yeah. it. And, um, and here we are. So you created a monster. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I have to, I do have to give a shout out to Ellen Soren, uh, the president of the board. And I mean, she's just been a tremendous partner in all of this. And of course the rest of the board as well. What a blessing that you guys have done here. I mean, in Gilbert's memory and, it would be the internship that he would design. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it really, it, it, there's so many aspects of it that are part of his, you know, <laughs> personality in life. Right. And, uh, you know, just been, it's been a, just a great tribute. Yeah. How do you, though, replicate that personality? Listeners of our show, they hear me talk about Gilbert a lot. And a big part of it was that he was such a, a a strong personality in the theater and always a great personality in the theater. Everything was going to be okay when Gilbert walked into the room. Is anyone doing this anymore? I mean, I think there are a lot of people like that. Um, you know, I, I often think that Philip Rosenberg is sort of a Gilbert in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, he, he's right. always got his mom's cookies on the tech table. Yeah, there you go. He's always got a smile on his face, you know, he's ready to give anybody a hug. And, uh, you know, I think there are just, uh, you know, and a lot of Gilbert's former students, I mean, Dwayne Schuler, yeah. uh, right. Alan Absolutely. Edelman, um, mm -hmm. you know, those, those guys are still out there sort of living, living the life that, that we did when we were working with Gilbert. Now, I'm going to just veer off a bit because since we're talking about Gilbert, Gilbert would bring several of his students with him all the time, <laughs> sometimes six or seven, if I remember correctly. And yeah. you guys would all cook together. You guys hang out together. You would eat together. You do everything together, right? Yeah, it was it was pretty much a... <laughs> 
I don't know whether what would you would call it. It's not a it wasn't a club. It was it was a commune. It was, it was, a, it was a bit of a commune. Yeah, it was your tribe. Yeah. I mean, when you had commune. eight people sleeping on the floor of the Mayflower yes, Hotel, you know, <laughs> the was... Mayflower. <laughs> yeah. I just remember that hotel in Miami when we were doing that show there, and uh, it was this tiny little room. But all of Gilbert's students had their sleeping bags with them and everything. And it was amazing, the feeling of community and the feeling of theater. And I think that he had cooking classes, too. Is that correct? Well, not on the road, but we certainly did at home, you know, when we were in Madison. I mean, like I was saying, it was, uh, you know, you you got assigned a task to do for uh for any dinner, and that was your sort of area. But going shopping with Gilbert was an amazing experience because <laughs> it, usually, it usually took like two or three shopping carts uh, to, to, <laughs> to get through the grocery store. And I've never seen anybody buy, you know, steaks the size of Gilbert that he would buy, you know, to put on the grill. And I, one of my earliest uh, responsibilities was to take lemon juice and squirt the flames on the grill ah. so that the lemon juice would <laughs> infuse the meat, you know. It's, Listen uh, to this. Yeah, this we, I, I learned a lot about cooking from Gilbert, actually. You guys are pros. <laughs> so tell us, what is your favorite Gilbert story? Because you spent uh, a lot of years with Gilbert. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I, I mean, I wish I'd had more. I, I, I was there as a student for three years, and then I was with him uh, about two and a half years in New York before he died. Um, you know, my favorite Gilbert story is really my first night in New York with Gilbert. Um, I had come up, he was working on a show at the Booth Theater called Monteith and Rand, and we uh, we we focused the show that day. Uh, Jim Spradling was the assistant on the show. He was a great assistant. He yeah. was the assistant's assistant. Yeah, yeah, his his drafting is still the benchmark of all, you know, and paperwork. But um, we got back to the Mayflower, and we're sitting there uh, having a drink, and um, Gilbert looks at me and he says, this is your first night in New York. What are we doing <laughs> in a hotel room? We should be out on the town. And so we... Went back out. We we basically stayed out all night long. I'll I'll spare you the details so that you can actually put this on the air. But it, <laughs> we went to a lot of clubs. Let's let's right. put it that way. And we ended up at a little restaurant in Little Italy, having white wines and scallops for breakfast. Ah. And, and we went we went outside the restaurant, hopped in a cab, and got to the 8 o'clock work call the next morning. Oh, my you know, God. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that was, that was my first night in New York City. And you thought every night in New York was going to be like that. That's right. right of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. Well, let me ask you, Mark. You've uh, certainly been involved in training and teaching for some time. Uh, you've been at Boston University for what? You said 16, 16 years? 16 years now. How's that going? Um, well, it's... It's going great, except that, you know, we hit this little thing called a pandemic. And, um, it, you know, those challenges, every, I mean, you guys are feeling it. Everybody's feeling it, right? It's just uh, how do you pivot so quickly to keep the education going? Um, I, I was lucky I actually had the fall at, off um, for a sabbatical. And um, so I came back, you know, pretty refreshed and ready to go. And it was it was just a little bit of a shock to have to, after only eight weeks, you know, change gears. But, um, you know, it's been a great experience. Teaching is harder than lighting any show I've ever lit. You know, it is really a huge challenge. Um, and uh, I'm responsible for both a BFA and an MFA group. And, you know, creating and sustaining... A uh, student's education over four years, you know, uh, my hat's off to everybody that's done it because it's really, really quite challenging. But um, I think we've done a pretty good job there. The, the exciting thing for us is that we moved into our new home about two and a half years ago, three years ago now. And that's just been a sea change in the way we teach and how we do shows. Um, you know, prior to that, we shared a theater with the Huntington Theater Company. Um, and it was a, it's a beautiful theater, but everything around it, the infrastructure around it was just really ancient. And, um, so now we're state of the art and we're, uh, we're really able to, I think, give, um, 
an in-depth study of lighting, design, and theater, you know, on a lot of levels that we could never do it before. So that's been great. But, you know, for me personally as a teacher, it was, uh, you know, the 15 years before the sabbatical, I was not a trained teacher. And so it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of figuring it out. You know, these there were programs and there were um, projects that I used from when I was a student that were no longer really working and everything. So the sabbatical was a good chance to kind of revisit everything and uh, and come back and, you know, try and look at creating a program for the next 15 years and see where hmm. that goes. What do you think the future is in teaching for you? Is it with technology and what parts of technology? Well, I am a bit of a dinosaur. I mean, I I really believe that <laughs> that the you know the fundamentals uh, of design are what I want to teach, um, and I leave the teaching of technology to the younger uh, faculty. Um, and I'm you, great. Have a great partner now in Jorge Arroyo, uh, who joined the faculty about two years ago, and you know he's really good at that stuff. Um, you know, I. I like teaching about art and design and theater and what makes it special. And so, um, you know, I'll continue to do that. But the challenge is that, you know, as you guys know, the, the careers that are out there are not necessarily grounded in theater anymore. You know, I mean, I guess they're grounded in theater because a lot of people like to hire theater students, but it's a different career certainly different than when I came into the business. So, um, you know, my goal really is to sort of meld the two worlds. Um, there's so much pressure to teach technology now, you know. Right. Um, yeah, the students want it. They, they, they want to be all be programmers. And uh, just, you can't blame them because it's a, a very exciting. Uh, but it's uh, difficult for, you know, people like us who basically are focused in the art. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for every hour that I'm teaching a student how to program a light board, that's an hour we're not talking about design. Right. And, you know, how many layers and how many classes are in vector works. I mean, uh, so, oh, you know, my God. It's like, Don't get us started. <laughs> so, <laughs> you you know, don't want to hear this. <laughs> but I, I, um, I, I, I sort of fall back to a conversation I had with a Broadway designer recently who one of my students was programming for. And he said he's a fantastic programmer. And I said, well, that's great, because I didn't teach him anything about programming. Uh, <laughs> I said, so what makes him such a good collaborator, you know, a colleague or a good programmer? And the, the designer said, well, he's a critical thinker. He's a problem solver. He's, he do, yeah. he's a creative artist and he's collaborative. I said, right. great. I taught, I, I, taught him all, I taught him all of that. <laughs> that I'll take credit for. <laughs> that's right. I didn't, I didn't teach him anything about programming. So, that's wonderful. That's but that makes thing. the point, you know, it's both. Yeah. It, it, these days, it really is both. So, Mark, you've had a full career and a very honorable one. Is there anything that you haven't done yet that you want to do? Rock and roll. Yeah, I haven't oh, done any oh, rock and roll, and I want to oh, do rock and roll. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know, and everybody says it's uh, uh, it's totally backwards, right? I mean, I did opera for the first part, ballet in the middle, and it should be rock and roll at the front end. But no, I mean, you know, I look at my colleagues. I look at Alan and the work sure. he does in TV lighting, and I go, man, I want to do that. And I've gotten to know Bob Barnhart recently, and I'm like, man, I want to do that. And then I see, yeah. I see Stephen Rosen and what he's doing with available light and all the architectural work he does I go, oh, wow. yeah and I go oh, man I want to do that you know and Heather Carson <laughs> right. and her work and I go oh, man yeah, I yeah. want to do that and then the fine yeah, art, yeah, yeah and then, I, then I say I just want to be Jim Ingalls for a day you know <laughs> if I could just be Jim Ingalls for a day because his career is just so amazing and he, the collaborators he has so yeah there's so much that I haven't done and that I would love to do but yeah rock and roll that's the that's the big one well that's I, cool. I have I have two words for you if you want to do rock and roll be young. <laughs> no, no, spinal tap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's rock and roll. You know, if you, if you get a shot, never turn anything that's down. That's right. I got a, a call to go see a band, and I went to see them in a club, and they were the worst things I had ever seen. They were called Wild Country, 
And I mean, people were throwing bottles at them. (laughs) You know, you are in Texas. (laughs) Six months later, they changed their name to Alabama. Oh, Oh, wow. You know, so you just never know who's going to make it. That's true. You never know. You know, speaking of of that, we're, we're talking about the students and careers. And so, you know, for those people listening out there who are early in their career and What do you see on the horizon? And if you have any words of wisdom to people starting out, Mark, what would you tell them? Well, I probably would tell them the same thing now that I would have told them five months ago before, you know, the lockdown. But I mean, I think right now the key is just stay hopeful. I mean, this is going to pass and theater is going to come back. It's an essential part of our lives and and it's going to be there. So. You know, it may take you a little bit longer to get started, but you've got to stay hopeful. You got to be patient. You got to be you got to persevere. You know, it it's it's not going to happen overnight. But um, you know, you have to cast a wide net in today's world. You can't. You you know, when students sit there when they come to uh, interview for being a a student at Boston University, they say, well, I want to be an opera designer. I want to be a dance designer. I'm like, "Ah, maybe you just want to be a lighting designer. You know, know, maybe Maybe that's a good, (laughs) that's a good place to start and see where, see where your career goes. And, you know, the, the, now it's, you got to take advantage of this time. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. so many resources online right now that are for Mm -hmm. free. And, right. you know, make your all the things that you can't learn while you're in school or didn't learn while you're in school. Um, you could you can take advantage of this time to mm-hmm. to, you know, really build your base. I mean, I this was actually a Gilbert quote, and I don't think it was even originated with him, but I stole it. And then now people think I say it, but it, I think I've heard other people say it as well. And that is, you know, the broader the base, the higher the pyramid. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you just have to continually broaden that base so you can get higher and higher and higher in in what you want to do. So, um, yeah. And I guess the, you know, the final stuff I would say is you got to respect your colleagues. You got to say thank you. You got to, you know, be nice to everybody on your way up because you sure as hell meet them on the way down. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It's a it's a challenging career. There's no question about it, and uh, you, it takes fortitude. You got to be strong, but um, the rewards are tremendous. So uh, hang in there. Nice. Well, Mark, well, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I just have one thing to say. Well, I have two things to say. One is this has been an incredible pleasure speaking for my brothers, and I'm sure they'll they'll tag on here to have you here, and you bring such a wealth of experience and knowledge and kindness to our industry. And the other thing I really want to say is Gilbert's looking down today and smiling. Uh, well, yeah. thanks. Because you, I cannot think of a better person to pick up the reins and to keep the spirit going. Thank you from me and also from all my colleagues for doing that. Well, it's, as it's been a labor of love and one I'm happy to do and continue for as long as I possibly can. Mark, thank you so much. You you laid down so much information in 43 minutes. <laughs> now, you are now an me- official member of the Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers Legacy. What is it, David? Legends, Legends of, of Life. Life. Legends of Life. That's right. You're in the Pantheon. You, you basically right. get a coffee mug. You, we'll send you a coffee mug. Right? That's about it. But don't put it in the dishwasher because no. everything will fall off of it. It's okay. not dishwasher safe. <laughs> well, I'll drink from it uh, with pleasure. You know, put scotch in it. It works That's really right. well with scotch. Do we have any extra shot glasses we can get him? Are we out of shot glasses? So ah, use the coffee mug. You can drink more. <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger. <laughs> it's a big coffee mug. It works, works, a, lot it works a lot better. And if you use alcohol in it, it you don't have to clean it ever. Because it's, you know, you're cleaning it with the alcohol all the time, right? It's, I like that. <laughs> we got to get you on the on the song too somehow. We oh yes, well, well, I was going to throw that in the end here, right here, right about now. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids, soon to be joined by Mark Stanley, doing playing something we don't know yet. <laughs> tell us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests and be sure to follow us on Facebook 
and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you should choose to litigate us, the law firm of Fleck, Flock, Flare, and Glare, and their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Katona, <laughs> Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss even more deeper mysteries of lighting design and technology on Light Talk. All that, and we'll bring you a sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Stay healthy and stay happy. And bye-bye from Light so Talk. And thank you, you Mark. Thank you, guys. Great interview. Yeah. Cool. Light Talk.